first experience with it was with a woman who was several years older than I am, and I initiated that relationship. So if they're trying to get at <laughs> any kind of uh, cause and effect thing there, I don't think they're going to find it. Yeah. In my case, like, I, I'd been involved in gay liberation for almost a year before I'd even had my first homosexual experience. So, you know, I was like 19 or 20 at the time. This is for the women uh, in the Lesbian Alliance. Does lesbianism have any relationship to the uh, feminist movement? If so, what is it? It has everything to do with the feminist movement because if women had equal rights with men, um, lesbianism would not be an issue at all. I mean, if women had a right to live and to make love with whom they wish to make love, that, then it would be an empty word. It would not be a threat. And in cases, um, feminists have become political lesbians um, and have had homosexual experiences because they feel that it is more of an equal relationship than they've had with men. Okay, well, there are many women who call themselves lesbians simply by the definition that they love women, they're spending their energies with women, and they may be 60 years old and have never, quote, gone to bed and getting into the intricacies of what sexuality is. They, their primary interest and support comes from women, and they call themselves lesbians. Does it seem to you that some of the problems of gay liberation are the same as the problems with women's liberation, in that women are held in low esteem and men who love other men are held in low esteem because they're felt to be like women? Yes. I think so. Right. An effeminate man is much more difficult to, to take for a very masculine man than a strong woman. Mm -hmm. But also the lesbian movement and the women's movement are sometimes very at odds with the gay male liberation movement because of their sexist attitudes. <laughs> Because they are men. And Many they places sure have they a lot are. Of them. I, know. I, yeah. I think it's. I think it's good to have a program like this. Uh, I don't. Maybe I shouldn't say anything about Iowa City, but <laughs> we were at a conference there last spring, and I know the women there refused to meet with the men, and even to allow them to try to understand why they would would not meet with them. Uh, you don't feel this way, apparently, or you wouldn't. We don't feel this way, but I felt that it was entirely the prerogative of those women if they thought what they needed was to get themselves together. I, I did, they... too. I, I didn't object. Many many men there did object, however. Um, a few uh, you know, were really upset. Which is upset. why many men object to lesbians, because it means, as one fellow told me, well, ladies only, and there's no place for me. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. people don't like to be... No, I, I didn't I've feel like that a... way, but I think it is nice, though, that we can at least... Uh, well, I've, I've been like at some gay dances in Iowa City going to that where, you know, the men and women were at odds for very basic reasons. The men were being pigs. I mean, the women mm. probably have dealt with that before, and they probably have good reason to feel that that will continue. Mm. Yeah. Would you consider going through a change of sex operation? <laughs> mm. No, I think that's transsexualism, which is an entirely different subject than, than homosexuality. Why are you having a program on homosexuality? Now, I think that I'd better answer that one, because I think that uh, that falls on my shoulders at this point. We're having a program on homosexuality because in fulfilling our commitment to the FCC uh, and seeking out the needs and interests of our community, one of the areas that is prominently mentioned is minority groups. This is a minority group. They were uh, in contact about um, the Marcus Welby program, and we said perhaps it would be a very good idea to allow these t two minority groups uh, to talk to you and explain some of the aspects of their lifestyle and their opinions, and so that's why they're there, <coughs> and uh, so that's the reason. What kind of home do you think two homosexuals could give children? A very loving home. Let's you know, that's kind of a strange question for anybody to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I think, again, there they're losing sight of the individuals. Two heterosexuals may provide a very terrible home for children, and two homosexuals might also provide a terrible home. And then again, depending on the individuals, how much they love children, how much they are able to give, um, it would depend on the individuals. Perhaps I'm, I'm going to make, you know, judgments from the gay parents I've seen, you know. 
which aren't a lot, but like in this area, the gay parents I've seen, you know, the children they have seem to be a lot healthier than a lot of younger children in that they're being raised in a more open atmosphere where, you know, sex is perhaps not repressed as much and it's not being made dirty or anything, you know. So in that sense, I think that the gay parents I have seen, you know, are raising probably healthier children than a lot of the straight parents that I have seen. Me. Uh, what you said, a freer attitude about sex, which may connote all sorts of things to the listeners when I... Sexuality. Right. Sorry. The I mentioned that I had three children. The first worry of one class was that my sons were going to be experimenting with each other, and I thought that was puzzled by that, since they weren't particularly worried that the children of heterosexual couples were going to be experimenting with each other simply because their parents were heterosexual. This is a question that relates to the fact that, that uh, are you ever worried about the fact that, that you're not going to have children so that, you know, homosexuals would die out if you all, <laughs> I'm not sure that's that horrible in the way it's written down. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, there, from my point of view, there are 50% more people in the United States than there were when I was born. And uh, I can't see that my bringing children in the world is going to help the situation that much. Uh, there are two and a half times as many people in the United States as there were when my father was born, and it seems to me that people would begin to feel crowded a little bit. I'm not sure if that's the way the question was no. asked. No, I think th by it, that they're implying did you interpret it that, that homosexuality, no. or the, the tendency to it, is transmitted through the that genes. Uh, the hereditary <laughs> and, and Well, also that yeah, right. we die out. If <laughs> everyone were homosexuals, that, the true. race would die out. Again, it's the emphasis on the sexual act, and there have been times of crises on this globe when people made it because children were needed, and it mm -hmm. was not within the romantic um, atmosphere of... Um, Plus, my, my artificial is insemination is possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there is a tribe... And cloning, if, if, yeah, yeah, yeah. if we get that Genesis. together. There is a tribe in Africa where, for the men, there's a specific time in their lives when 100% of the male population has to engage in homosexual behavior, or else they're ridiculed, you know, much as men in our society are ridiculed if they do engage in homosexual behavior. And yet, you know, this they just can't envision, you know, people not believing that this can coexist with heterosexuality and, and their tribe has not been dying out. It's the African Siwan tribe if anyone's interested, so. How do psychologists react to you or treat you? <laughs> I don't know <laughs> They stay away probably from most of them. There, there are some who, like I said before, you know, still have the view that homosexuality is an illness and those who do not, you know, <coughs> long with. There are, have been several questions about individual occupations of the panelists, and we had decided earlier that we were not going to talk about uh, their occupations as such and um, things like their hometowns and brothers and sisters and things. Mm -hmm. So that I, if you've wondered about why the question about occupations has not been asked, it's because we had decided earlier that perhaps it would be just as well in this case not to go into that. What type of future do you see for yourselves? How do you see yourselves when you're, you're 60? I think that's too far away for me. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't even know what I'm going to be doing a year from now, exactly. I have certain plans, maybe, but I'm not really certain about those, even. Well, the rest of you see yourselves at 50 or 60. Okay, I guess, again, I'd like to say that this is not a representative group. It's young, and it's people who feel they can afford the openness, afford to be seen, quote, as homosexuals. And so to get any conclusions, even to say what our occupations were and to come to a general conclusion, or do homosexuals have hopes for the future, and how does that... We can't really draw any conclusions from the group that's here. But I, I don't mean to stop anybody else from answering that question. I just wanted to keep that perspective. Any other comment? I see myself as probably being older and hopefully more mature and, <laughs> you know, all those other good things that are supposed to go on with you as you grow up. And <laughs> when you uh, realized that you were homosexual, was there a sudden moment when you knew it or was it a gradual realization? This uh, refers back to what you were discussing earlier. Did you just know it or was it the gradual development? Of knowledge. Well, I had had, you know, many crushes on when I was in grade school, even, you know, say on teachers or, or students, women students in high school. 
And I don't know when I first knew that those feelings were homosexual. I remember, uh, you know, running across an article about homosexuality, you know, in magazines and stuff. But one thing about growing up as a lesbian, that most of the literature has, has been on male homosexuality. So you don't really see yourself reflected hardly at all. You know, you, you read an article hoping you find something out about yourself, and what you find out about is male homosexuality, and really not yourself e at all, whether it's good or bad. What are gay bars, and are they necessary? <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> what are heterosexual bars, and are they necessary? And I guess gay bars are necessary because of the kind of persecution um, people receive going in, go into a bar and aim. You cannot quite behave. I don't mean behave exotically, just simply behave tenderly, or even stand too close or sit too close to someone in a bar and aim. Or dance. Um, right, dance. With what would happen if you did? Um, it would depend. Sometimes nothing. Sometimes um, you would interest a few rather virile males in the place and taking you on, or um, or you would just let it be known. I mean, for us this may not be a problem, but for some people who wish to be together and to go out for an evening, to go out and be tender with each other in a in a public bar, they would fear that people would quote guess about them. So they need a place where they can feel protected and feel that they're not going to be spied on or accused simply of being with each other. Or looked down upon. Probably to answer the first part of the question, just in case they don't realize that gay bars are bars where gay people tend to congregate, although not, they're not necessarily all homosexuals that are there. You know. That's by definition. Did you find an implication that, that uh, the business of, and are they necessary, that there was an implied uh, aspect of making contact. This is a place where homosexuals could contact other homosexuals. Um, I don't understand your question exactly. But perhaps the necessity was that this is at least oh. one place where yeah, where you could uh, make contact. That, that is, is that a reason? That's one of their big functions. It's where you can meet other gay people, you know, so that you won't feel isolated. <laughs> This is to uh, the women. I'm quoting now from the question. Did you choose the homosexual way of life as an alternative to the heterosexual way due to an uh, incapacity to cope with heterosexual uh, relationships and the heterosexual way of life? If this is true, isn't this as negative a thing to run away from heterosexuality as it is from homosexuality? I think that's more of a statement than a question. Um, yes, and, and it's presuming that um, it's presuming a certain kind of running away. I simply fell in love with an individual before any sexual contact. Fell in love with an individual who happened to be a woman, and then I began to understand what the distinctions were between homosexual and heterosexual, and what was forbidden to me because I happened to fall in love with a woman, not a man. That doesn't speak for everyone. It just speaks for me. Does anyone else want to comment on the question? This is directed to the panel uh, as a whole. What do you think causes people in old age to turn to homosexuality after a life of heterosexuality? Well, Repressed homosexuality, possibly. I'm not sure that sexuality is, you know, completely defined in people. I think it's something that has a potential to change, you know, once again. And perhaps any time in your life, you know, these changes may be going on. So, perhaps just a change in their attraction. Perhaps it's more convenient in older age, too, I'm not sure. Right. If that happens, they don't have that much to fear, for one thing. If and um, with the number of women there are compared with the number of men, it would be so rare to find an individual with whom you could be warm and tender. At that age, you don't have too much. You know, you don't have to plan a whole life. You don't have to quote plan a homosexual life because suddenly someone tells you you're homosexual. What exactly is the gay liberation movement? I can talk about its history. You, you know, in different areas in the country, there are different goals for different gay liberation groups. It's impossible to generalize. Gay liberation was formed, uh, well, spread across the country in 1969 after a gay bar was raided by police, which is not an uncommon thing. And it was the first time that the gay people fought back. It was in Christopher Street in New York City. And, it, and a, several, <coughs> several days of riots ensued. And out of this sprang up an organization, and the organization just went across the country very fast, various organizations. Uh, so doctrine I, and dogma, you know, it varies from people to people. 
I mean, there's no, you know, across the board uh, endorsement of this piece of legislation or this kind of thing? Well, there might be specific goals that, you know, no gay liberation group would be against, but like... <laughs> Well, implied in gay liberation is freedom for homosexuals. And however that can be brought about, changing the laws, education, such as things like this program, changing people's minds, you know, getting rid of the stereotypes and the fears about homosexuality. And, and I think those are pretty common in most groups. So that gay liberation would be liberating not simply for gay people, but for all people in terms of dealing with their own homosexuality. Mean, yeah, their own, oh, what a slip. <laughs> dealing with their own sexuality honestly. And um, I, th I think to help people understand homosexuality rationally rather than emotionally, uh, re to realize that we're not a threat, I don't think anyone here is trying to threaten anyone else. Um. Not threatening. There have been implications in some of the questions that have come through mm -hmm. and are, yeah. are down in the stack a little bit, and there are several times that it's been asked, is, you know, you're all fairly normally dressed. Um, <laughs> are you, are you uh, giving a fair picture of the homosexual? Why aren't some of you, you know, wearing makeup or... I'm not know. wearing makeup. <laughs> I'm not the, wearing makeup. <laughs> the, all right. Uh, the, you know, are you... Well, listen, my suit and tie was at the cleaners, <laughs> and I just didn't have it ready in time for the show. Once again, this, this goes on to more fundamental questions, like for gay, gay men who do want to wear things which are generally reserved for women in our society and their women's apparel, you know, it's a freedom thing, once again, you know. I feel people who, you know, want to wear makeup if they're a man or even a dress as such, you know, I don't think their rights should be infringed upon. You know, that's a right of free expression. I don't think we need to apologize for these but people. But I think everyone here is giving a, f a fair picture of him or herself. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think also most homosexuals in this community, they dress yeah. comfortably, as most people do now. Transvestite, transvestites, um, male transvestites, I guess is a better way of putting it, are not exclusively homosexual people. Lots of times heterosexual men enjoy dressing up in what society refers to as women's apparel. Once again, it's as common among heterosexuals as homosexuals. Which I think in that listener's question is a confusion. Even the transsexual question and confusing homosexuality automatically with transvestitism and transsexualism, I think that um, there are a lot of misconceptions which um, need exposing and exploring. You seem to be defensive uh, about the questions that are being asked. Are you, do you feel animosity uh, toward the questions that are being submitted? I think it's tremendous that we've had this many questions. Do you uh, consider that these are crank questions? Do you, no. you no, must no, have met no, a lot no, of no, different no, kinds. No, no, no. And our audience no, doesn't no. ask questions yeah. like, like that. I it doesn't seem to me that these have been really unfair. You've, no. you've responded uh, sometimes rather strongly to them, or defensively to them, but, but not, you're not casting aspersions on the, no, we're not the asking <coughs> of the question. No, casting aspersions on the question asker or even the question, but having heard some of these questions many times, we're trying to answer more than the question because we see something behind the question. So we want to answer the question and answer some other questions which may have helped to uh, compose the question. You know, oftentimes I think we need to ask these same questions back to the heterosexuals, you know. That, that's perhaps when we're sounding defensive, when we say, you know, what do the heterosexuals feel about this about themselves? But it's important for them to realize that the basic aspects are, you know, par very parallel in these questions. Why did you feel it necessary to tell your parents about your homosexuality? I figured it'd be better that I told them rather than them having to find out for somebody else. Because knowing the town I grew up in, the way they probably would have found out would have been through gossip. And it wouldn't have been fair to them at all for somebody else to tell them that I was gay. And it's a big load off myself. I could now, now I can do pretty much what I want to without having to worry about them. David? I said I didn't. I never have. Um, communication broke down between me and my parents quite a long time ago, before, before I started telling anyone that I was homosexual. And uh, I can't see anything too constructive <laughs> in my particular situation about telling them. I don't think they would, I don't think they would uh, feel any better if I told them than if I didn't. So you do, so 
it was not your homosexuality that caused the original breakdown in communication? I don't feel that it was. Uh, it's possible, of course. I think in my case, you know, once again, I'm sort of similar to Harold. I was, a, you know, I felt like I owed it to my father to tell him myself rather than to have someone else tell him, you know. I was aware of the consequences as a possibility, but, you know, I could have been pleasantly surprised also and he could have reacted favorably. It's a possibility you have to, you know, think about. So. Not only that, but, you know, it eases a burden yeah. that you don't have to keep hiding from your parents who, who brought you up and who um, at times have been the closest people to you. Do you, uh, some of you, have cl still close relationships with your parents? You said that you do not. Um, I don't think my relationship with my father was really that close before. Once again, it's important. This didn't help communication, admittedly, but we disagreed on many things before this, sort of the generation gap thing. Somewhere down in the stack, too, is the question of whether or not this is just, uh, whether your homosexuality and open avowal isn't just another uh, type of, of uh, revolt against parental authority and relationships, and that it, you know, you might have taken to drugs, you might have done something else, um, but this is a movement. Well, if that were the case, it's certainly a lot healthier than drugs. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't feel that this is a response to it, it might be for individual people once again, but I don't think you know that's necessarily the case. I think we have a basic idea of what we're trying to change, you know, in society and what we're trying to restructure. And that's, you know, if we can further those goals by being open, then that's what we'll have to be. <coughs> what are your opinions of the gay and glitter rock bands? Mm. Mm. Uh, I don't know anything about them. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> what are they referring to? I think like Elton Edgar, John? Edgar Winter. No. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, oh. Some of them are pretty good. It's just you know. their way of expressing there themselves are, for the music. Yeah, there are like gay individual singers now who are putting out albums of music and things, which I don't think fit into the category that that person was talking about. I'd be more uh, positive about that. Than uh, it's kind of off than it is, and I was reading an old Time magazine where uh, they did many pictures on Flip Wilson and drag as Geraldine, and Geraldine seems very popular, and yet I don't know any female comedian who dresses so um, masterfully masculine and has support. I just thought that was very interesting that they gay and glitter and Geraldine. Everybody loves Geraldine, even though know, that's just another side of Flip Wilson. Directed to the women. <coughs> what are your feelings in a straight bar or lounge if a man tries to pick you up? Well, that depends, I guess. <laughs> Sometimes, if he's really pushy, it's God, you know, go away. Uh, a lot of times it's just boredom, because, you know, this happens a lot. Yeah. Just get rid of him, that's all. <laughs> we'll be back after this message. Standard and Elizabeth Taylor look-alike contest, and I never even heard from them. Preposterous! We are short. Forty-eight cents. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! No, well, I had to stop looking because uh, you know who came in. <laughs> well. Oh, 
It's the Lucy Show, every Wednesday and Friday night at 6.30 p.m. here on Television 5. Straighten your tie. Company's coming. Three little maids from the toughest school in the jungle. Yeah! The general. The field marshal. The colonel. Savage sisters. Are you the girl to call for the camp? You run right on time! Savage Sisters, rated R. We're continuing our discussion with members of the Gay People's Alliance and the Lesbian Alliance. A lot of questions, and... <laughs> okay, why does the panel seem so sad? Why don't they smile? <laughs> right. so yes. Smile? Okay. Um, where is the question? There's one here that I want to ask because it involves... Here we are. I have just found out that my husband is a homosexual. Should I confront him with it? Quietly divorce him, or what do you suggest? Oh, well. Let's take it as a serious question, all right? And I will right. assume that it is. If I were talking to that person, and it was something that were really disturbing her, and that is her husband with whom she has a relationship, I would certainly try to talk to him about it. Just personally. No, I wouldn't confront in the way some people use that term as accusingly but as something that they may need to talk about and, and something they need to work out. So you do think the business of talking, at least bringing it out in the open, rather yeah. than just... That's the best way to make a decision, you know, make it mutually and talk about it. What is the significance of the word Hector <laughs> on your T-shirt? <laughs> it has no connection with uh, the gay movement. It's a magazine that some friends of mine are putting out. It's called Hector and Hector, which is also on the back of the t-shirt. And um, it'll be coming out around the end of October, if you're interested. In <laughs> <laughs> All right, now we've done a plug for that. We'll send you a bill when it's a rousing success. <laughs> Do you feel that you are fighting a losing battle as far as gaining public acceptance of homosexuality? No, not at all. We wouldn't have been here two years ago even, you know. We've, we've accepted ourselves. Yes, then. yes. Well, you might not have been we here, but we have. did a program. I realize that, but I'm talking about us. <laughs> we would not have felt as much support two years ago. And um, I don't know how public that is, but probably just in our personal lives of being open with the people we know, we've received enough support to be able to come here. This goes back once again to an interest in, in your early training and your early reactions. Had your parents talked openly with you about, did, about sex? And in general, were your parents happily married? What's happily married? You know, you're reading it when you're inside. You can s people see the marriage from different points of view. Like there were times when I didn't think my parents were happily married at all. I thought they should get a divorce. But then I, that's just because I'd been raised on TV, and you know, all the couples on TV are so happy and they never fight and argue and all this stuff. And my parents never talked about sex. Mm -hmm. It was talking about early training, and it's kind of a side like that. In terms of guilt and in terms of those things which are instilled, um, becoming pregnant before legal marriage was made such a stigma when I was a child that even though I was married, I was pregnant, and somehow I thought I had done something wrong. So I, you know, there was no other discussion about sex in my training other than you don't get pregnant before marriage. Uh, Sex wasn't discussed much at all in, uh, by my parents. I did remember asking my mother when I was 10 years old, you know, how are babies made? And she said, well, wait until your younger sister's older, and then I'll tell you. And so she told my younger sister, but somehow managed to skip me. So I never found out, you know, from my parents. They found out other ways. But sexuality is fairly much a closed subject at our house. Yeah. yeah. I think once again, you know, I'd have to go along with the crowd and sex wasn't talked about hardly at all in my family. 
if at all. Girl? Yeah, I feel the same way, um, except some book was placed prominently in some spot where I would see it, but that's, I don't remember my parents actually talking to me about it. David? Um, to answer both parts of the question, I think my parents were happily married, but they never talked to me about sex. Are any of you from broken homes? I know a foster home. But I think more than just sex and the act of sex, I'm wondering about how much um, physical display of affection. Parents are often very embarrassed even to hug or give a little peck. Many parents are very reserved in front of their children so that children observe their parents as almost non-sexual beings or non, non-touching beings. Yeah, I think, you know, you can't generalize just because of us, you have to realize that many heterosexuals, once again, grow up in the same environment where sex isn't discussed. For my peer, peer group, when I was growing up, I knew that was the big thing. Are our parents going to talk to us about it? You know, I remember that. And for most people, it never happened, so. What would you do if your parents uh, were trying to force you to go straight against your will? <laughs> That's what my father has been trying to do. <laughs> um, I broke off communication for a while just because we both needed time to think, you know. He wanted me to go to a psychiatrist to be cured, quote-unquote, and I, I made the suggestion that I might go if he would go along, too, because I thought he was having a lot more problems dealing with, you know, this than I was at the time. Um, there, you know, in this state, you can be committed to a mental institution by members of your family with doctor's signatures, and that was threatened once on me, but... Fortunately, that's never happened. I might have to go underground if you really, really, you know, made an all-out effort. Essentially, of course, this is what all parents are trying to do, whether they realize it or not. I mean, all parents are trying to make their children grow up straight. And they may not, they may not realize that their child is developing as a homosexual, but the atmosphere in homes is uh, to be heterosexual, isn't it? I don't know if it's so much an effort as just a presumption. Yeah. And many of the yeah. things that um, parents do that they may think uh, is reinforcing a heterosexual attitude is actually creating just the opposite, the way your parents relate to each other. In some cases, that could be, or what the child can see. It's just presumed that a child will, will pick up the attitudes of the parents. And um, it's a presumption, I think, more than, a, than an effort. Yeah, you know, I, di I didn't mean it was a conscious effort because mm -hmm. they may they may not know that the child has. Mm -hmm. uh, Hopefully, as more of the humanistic movements, you know, keep going, this will not necessarily be the case. I think I've seen changes, you know, in the past few years. John Paul Sartre says that homosexuality reveals itself through frustration and hatred to society. What do you think of the statement, bearing in mind that Sartre is one of the most adamant homosexuals in Europe? I think he's speaking from another generation and another culture, for one thing, and um, I imagine any group, homosexuals, um, women, black, Chicanos, any group might present only a frustrated, angry front to the group that has the power and is excluding them and oppressing them. Frustration and anger would seem a very normal response. There are many gay people who do hate themselves, you know, perhaps he is one of them. I mean. If you look at the reasons why, perhaps it's not because he's a homosexual, but because of what he's been told about being a homosexual. Yeah. I don't think we have to defend his position. I don't think it's a matter of hating society, it's a matter of constructively changing society. Do you have any estimate of the number of homosexuals in the <coughs> United States? Kinsey's statistics are about the best that I know of to go by. And they state that at any one time in the population, 10% of the population is, is engaged in predominantly homosexual behavior, which, you know, would be over 20 million people who are engaged in predominantly homosexual behavior in the country right now. Those studies have been backed up by studies that have came since. So. Have the members of the panel experienced uh, both physical and tender relationships? this would be the only way to really know if they are homosexual. 
I don't know about that because I ran into some women who call themselves lesbians who have never, quote, been to bed with a woman, but that doesn't disturb them. They do not see that as the essence of their identity. There are many virgins, I mean, in this country who um, may never um, have sexual experience, but they still can have an identity. Your sexual identity is not necessarily um, indicative of what your experience is. You know, here there's the emphasis again on the sexual act and the way you experience life and people. And I think they're separate at times. That is talking about, <coughs> excuse me, that is talking about activity to some extent. You can be homosexual and be celibate, of course. There's a question that would like to have you deal a little bit more with the um, emotional relationships rather than just physical relationships. Um, would you discuss this type of thing other than the physical relationships? I think, you know, there's a common myth in society, once again, when they think of homosexual. As Connie said, you know, they just think of sex. They don't, they don't give us credit for having human emotions. They don't give us credit for being human beings oftentimes. And heterosexuals don't have a corner on all the human emotions. It's important for them to realize, you know, we feel the same things. We, we even go through the same jealousy trips, the same power trips oftentimes because we've been raised in this society, you know. What can you say? We feel love, we feel hate, anger, hurt. <laughs> Any other? Responses? Yes. Um, one girl once asked that uh, if her friend told her that she were homosexual, her first worry would be, well, why does this woman want to hang around with me? Does she want to, uh, you know, is she simply interested in sex? And I think many women who are heterosexual have emotional needs met by men with whom they certainly don't go to bed. They simply have emotional support from that group of people. And the same thing with women. There are many strong emotional relationships which do not involve um, sexual activity. Connie, this question goes back to you again. Uh, it's the concern over the th your three sons. Mm -hmm. You do not have custody of the children? No, I do not. Mm -hmm. And is it uh, the experience of lesbian mothers that they cannot keep custody of the children. That was definitely um, a threat and a reason for not fighting it since both my ex-husband and I wanted the children, but there are other considerations, his ability to provide for, and many things were thought of besides that when we made the decision. But certainly this would, it would be a, entirely possible it was Probably entirely possible that, the that would lose if, custody. if um, the lesbian issue were not a threat, I certainly um, would have considered fighting for them rather than... Um, the viewer is interested in knowing, in addition, if you had custody of them, would you rear them as heterosexual <laughs> or homosexual? I children? would simply rear them as the individuals they are. I have no hopes that they go in either direction, even now that I'm not primarily rearing them, I still have a great deal of contact and I've certainly put no pressure either way. I hope they find themselves as individuals. How do you feel about a homosexual flaunting his or her feelings uh, in front of heterosexuals? I think heterosexuals have been flaunting their feelings in front of us for too long. <laughs> I think, you know, it's a very, very positive thing. And with that, perhaps I do have a bit of bitterness in my voice, I'm not sure. Anyone else want to comment? I think that depends on the individual. Some people are <coughs> really fond of displaying affection publicly, whether they're heterosexual or homosexual. But for a homosexual who wants to, you know, touch someone they love in public, they could um, be bitter or else uh, that would be called flaunting. When it were not flaunting, it was simply a natural act of, of tenderness, which is considered flaunting to a group of people who aren't used to um, seeing that behavior. Because I think that it perhaps was missed, would you restate your feeling about the Marcus Welby program as it relates to the molesting of children? Um, I don't think anyone here would want to excuse child molesting. I think uh, the objection was the confusion and and the fact that there was no effort in that program to make a distinction between homosexuality and um, child molesting. But a program that was on 15 minutes before Marcus Welby in which some girl running down the beach in a bathing suit was shot by a man, mm -hmm. I should think many heterosexual men would feel maligned. So then we have the question of the media and uh, the messages which are aired, not only the Marcus Welby show, but the Marcus Welby show immediately affects us at this time. 
Do any of you have any sexual drives at all toward the opposite sex? I don't. You know, I'm not, I've been told I should be worried about that, but it doesn't particularly bother me. I have emotional drives towards women, but that doesn't mean they have to be sexual also. To put that in less loaded language, does that simply mean are there members of the opposite sex that we might consider making love mm -hmm. with where we so inclined and were that? I would think because that's what sexual implied, is. drive, I mean, first for me, I'm not that promiscuous a person. I tend to be very slow, very committed, and there are men whom I've found attractive and who have been very good friends and were I in such a position would consider making love with a person with whom I was in love with. In my case, I've had like several heterosexual dreams that I can remember. They sort of freaked me out because I wasn't expecting them to happen. <laughs> Those are the basic heterosexual impulses of my life. <laughs> All right. Anyone else? How can a man who is married and has children suddenly turn around and fall in love with another man? <laughs> That's assuming that you can only love one person. You know. Perhaps you can. Perhaps it's not, you know, out of out of reach to love more than one person, you know, even in a sexual way. It's another myth that our society has perpetuated upon us that we tend to accept without thinking about. And the having children part of that question brings a lot of questions to my mind. First of all, does having children, uh, if a man has children, is that a way of proving that he is definitely heterosexual or does it exclude other experiences? Or is she, sim is she he, or whoever wrote that question simply talking about responsibility to the relationship and not the the affections and feelings that the man may be feeling. Question. If you have any deep religious feelings, what is the reason for God's making two sexes if it's normal to live as one? To live as one. Well, they can't prove that for one thing. And like I said, a lot of religion, religion is based on faith. And you can't prove it either way. People have to make their own personal judgments when it comes to religion. I think there's sort of a threatened... The person who wrote that sounds like they're a bit threatened, like they're, they think we're saying that everyone should be a homosexual, you know. And that's not what we're saying at all. We're saying, you know, sexuality is viable no matter what lifestyle you choose. They also seem to presume that reproduction is somehow connected with love, and it is not always such. Children may be produced without love and people may love each other without etc. This is a, a uh, viewer who has <coughs> called in with a quote from, from the Bible about homosexuality. What do you think of what the Bible says against homosexuality? First Timothy 1, 10, 11. Yes, these laws are made to identify as sinners all who are immoral and impure homosexuals, kidnappers, liars, and all others who do things that contradict the glorious good news of our blessed God, whose messenger I am. This is from the Living Bible. Okay. It's also from Paul, <laughs> who, right. is, who is probably... You're saying that, the, that it has been no, identified... Paul is, Paul's the person who wrote that in the Bible, St. Paul. Saint Paul. Yeah, he, um, he was the one who also wrote that women should not cut their hair and should remain quiet in church. And <laughs> He created a lot of what I consider to be a lot of the problems within our society now, today, in dealing with sexuality, simply because of many of the things that were written. I mean, I myself don't personally believe, you know, the Bible is divinely inspired. I'm not speaking for gay people at all. There are gay people who would try to defend that position. But they also seem to be taking the viewpoint that, you know, all homosexuals are Christian. But a lot of them aren't. You know, there are Jewish homosexuals and there are, you know, and being non-Christian does non not necessarily mean that one is an atheist. And there are many Christians who um, accept the Pauline doctrines with reservation because you have to look at the texts in the Old Testament on which the, the New Testament texts were composed. We will be back for the final segment of our program after this message. Gamo, come on, we've only got a few seconds. Relax, Navis. Relax, he says. How can I relax? Where's vertical hold? Don't worry, boss, he'll make it. He's a pro. Never fear. Vertical hold is here. Uh oh. <laughs>
It's the new game in town, the World Football League. Harmon and Alex Hawkins bring the exciting play-by-play -play action. Don't miss the next game. We still have a stack of questions, but we have reached the point where a number of them have been uh, answered earlier in the program, and so uh, we will get rid of some of those. Um, this is a question about um, uh, what the heterosexual person's response can be as far as being of help to the homosexual community. David? Uh, once they find out that a friend of theirs or a relative or you know, someone that they're close to is homosexual, I think the best thing they can do is to continue to treat them the same way that they've treated them before. This, is, this has been, for me, the best response I've had from anyone, and it's happened several times. Uh, the thing to remember is that when you find out that someone you know is homosexual, it doesn't mean that they're different. It means that you're different, because now you know something about them that you didn't know before. But they're probably not going to act any differently if you don't. That's All right. Anyone else? Did any of your parents have homosexual traits? I don't know. What's a homosexual trait? I'm not sure what they mean by that at all. No. The answer would probably be most most probably growing up in the society they probably had had feelings now if they had identifiable traits as to how they move their hands or, or how f you know how feminine or masculine either one of them acted uh, they probably had homosexual tendencies as most people do or experiences or feelings but by the time they were married there probably wasn't anything you could put your finger on <laughs> all right uh, this Sometimes when, when the questions are taken down, because especially when we have a lot of them, the questions aren't quite clear, so <laughs> allow for that, if you will, please. Do the people on the panel feel more paranoid that they must identify the character on the Welby program as a homosexual first and a child molester second when the crime was child molesting? Is that a sign of your paranoia? I, I don't guess, think we identified him. I don't think one. we identified him no. as a homosexual, but we were listening carefully as to how Dr. Welby and the other people were dealing with the boy's fears, and I think very definitely the boy was afraid of what that experience meant, that his friends would think he was homosexual, and the father, I really question what the father meant when he said, I think you ought to throw all those creeps in jail. I think if, I was wondering if he meant child molesters or if he simply meant, you know, homosexuals. At that point, Dr. Welby tried to calm him, but he didn't calm him specifically enough to um, make it clear. In a lesbian relationship where one tends to act like the man, what is the difference between this and a heterosexual relationship? I've never been in a lesbian relationship where one tries to act the man. That's a, another presumption that that's how lesbian relationships work. This is a little late in the program to do this, but uh, Perhaps it would be well to take the time. Would you give a clear, concise definition of a homosexual and a lesbian? <laughs> I wonder if you would all just define it. I'm not sure the if there same. is a clear, concise definition. It's different for every person. Well, they where they define we're it. We're not themselves. trying to be evasive. I think this sounds evasive, mm. but a lesbian certainly would be a female homosexual, <laughs> but, but, and some confusion. But I think some books that have been written define. Um, lesbian as a woman whose primary emotional and um, erotic and um, identity needs are Social. met 
primarily, not exclusively, but primarily by women and not by men, which is still vague. I think the object of your affection is a person of the same sex. There are Wouldn't that apply? In no, I'm not sure, because there are people who haven't ever dealt with their homosexual feelings, who still are probably homosexuals, even though they're acting out a heterosexual lifestyle. He said lifestyle. object of affection. He didn't say going to bed with or no, saying no, I, or even admitting no, to yourself that yeah. I'm Well, there are people who even hide that, I think, from themselves, but they still may have, you know, quote, well, sexual attraction to members of the same sex and they haven't, that they haven't dealt with. I don't think you can come up with a really clear, concise, good definition because people are so different. And it's true the homosexual community as it is true the heterosexual. Why does the male try to become more feminine to attract other males if he is interested in the male sex? Those are myths and stereotypes again coming through. That's not necessarily the case. And, you know, there are heterosexual men who fit into the category of feminine as society defines it, once again. And they're okay. trying to attract women, yeah. Unfortunately, many effeminate men are wrongly accused of being homosexual simply because they exhibit mannerisms which are reserved only for women in this culture. Wasn't the sin of homosexuals um, the contributing factor in God's destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? No, it was not, because the original words for no, in the English Bible, in translating that passage, all words no are written down as no, but there were different verbs for the word no, and the word we want to know them, which was used in the original text, was not the sexual no, it was simply the acquainted no. I've recently been told that in Ezekiel 35, I haven't checked it myself, so <laughs> someone else can if they want to look that up, it says that Sodom and Gomorrah were uh, destroyed because of the way they treated their poor rather than because of their homosexual sins. So. I had heard that it was the way that they treated the guests. Yeah, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. too. That's one interpretation. Yeah. Like, there's so many different possible interpretations to almost any biblical passage. But so the one that that question is based on is based on the passage, yeah. you know, we want to know them, mm -hmm. and they presumed that that was the sexual norm. How can a parent... Um, determine or what can the parent look for to determine if a child has homosexual tendencies? I think if the parent-child relationship were, you know, open and loving and sex were talked about, perhaps the child would talk about their feelings, homosexual or heterosexual. I think that's the only way the parent can really determine because otherwise the child will probably have defense mechanisms up and not talk about his, his or her sexu sexuality regardless of what it is. And even construct very elaborate dating fronts and clothing habits to um, persuade the fearful parent that he or she is not homosexual. So you, you well, would say that the open relationship, which would not right. make it necessary to look for things, right. but to... Correct. And are there homosexual traits among the people sitting here even? Can you identify one particular trait which automatically defines us as, as homosexuals? Yeah. And then how mm -hmm. can you go back and transfer that to your child. This goes back to the very beginning of the program. How do you tell a homosexual? And I don't, uh, we don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, would you repeat uh, the box number that you gave earlier and would you repeat uh, your address? Uh, the Lesbian Alliance box number is P.O. Box 1287 ISU Station, Ames, Iowa. Dennis, will okay. you? We presently have an office in room three of Memorial Union on campus. Since we're a student-recognized group, we have a phone number, which is 294-5237. And what's our post office box? 1001. OK, our post office box is 1001 <coughs> ISU Station, if anyone wants to write. And it's important to remember that you know if you come to our organizational meetings or if you write to us, it doesn't mean you're going to necessarily have to come out in the open, such as we have, because we don't force that upon anyone. The same is true of our organization. That if they do wish to remain anonymous, anonymous statements is respected. It's respected, definitely. What are your views concerning the propagation of the race? It seems to be continuing. <laughs> there are too many people at a rapid enough rate <laughs> as it is. I think. <laughs> What are the um, major goals of your local organization? One of the major goals we have right now is just to help gay people in this area any way we can. If 
you know, if they have some idea or if they just want to talk or... We're not really that, you know, we don't have set goals, things we want to do as such, but we just want to help gay people accept themselves. Our... Okay. Okay. Just the Lesbian Alliance has those same goals, a support group, but they also wish to um, to be visible so as not to be overlooked and to cooperate with other women's groups because we feel the, um, the issue of lesbianism is also important and, and the issue of women's rights. I think in the main, although we have a number of questions that are left, there are variations on questions that have been asked. As the, during the last segment of Dimension 5, we always make a point of asking the individual members of the panel if they have any comments that they wanted to make when they came this evening, if they haven't made so far, anything you'd like to reiterate or stress. So I'll do it. And I'll do it now. Jim? Any last comments? No, not really. Connie? No. Oh. <laughs> I'm just a very gentle, non-threatening person, and I should hope that... Uh, well, I should hope that the homosexual identity should become less threatening and the individual should be considered. Okay. I think I've said... <laughs> Dennis? The only thing I could say is I hope that if there are like gay people out there watching, which I'm sure there are, you know, who need support, that in some way perhaps this show has helped. I think it has positive, you know, potential in that way. I think it was a good program. Carolyn? Yeah, I think it was a good program too. That's all. David? I agree with what Dennis said. I hope I hope it has been educational for everyone watching, and uh, I think I think this is important. I think uh, speaking to classes and being on this program and similar programs are one of the best things that we can do. I think also that if everyone were aware of all of the people that they know that are homosexual, that they could realize that you know that these these are people they've known for years perhaps and uh, realize that they're not terrible people they're not strange people they're not people that nobody knows uh, I think as as long as homosexuals remain in hiding uh, it's possible to regard them as a much smaller minority than they are and also as something that's outside our experience and I hope that people now can you know are beginning to realize that this is not something that's outside anyone's experience. I want to thank you very, very much for being with us tonight, for uh, letting us ask questions that cannot have been easy for you and that would not be asked of just, you know, a heterosexual panel, you know, it would not be that kind of thing. I do thank you for being here. I appreciate it. I think our viewers will have found it an educational experience. We hope so. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you again next week for Dimension 5. Good night.